Welcome to Transforming Medical Communications, a podcast by MedCom's experts. We share medical communications insights and advice from the best and brightest in the industry to find out what they're doing to push our industry forward. Here's your host, Wesley Portages. Welcome to the Transforming Medical Communications podcast. I'm your host, Wesley Portugues, and with me today is Michael Moore. Michael is a world-class medical science liaison, having presented data on numerous topics to HEPs throughout the United States. He is known as a go-to storyteller, and today we're going to talk more about how MSLs help educate and engage HEPs. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you, Wesley. Howdy, y'all. How's it going? Very good, very good. I'm glad to have you here today. Um, Michael, we of course already know that you're an MSL now, um, but I am interested to hear a little bit more how you got here. So maybe you can take us a little bit through your background. Yeah. So my story is that I entered into a PhD thinking that I was going to be an academic professor. I had totally romanticized the lifestyle, teaching the next generation, inspiring them. And then about a year into my PhD, I realized I don't like doing science. I don't like being relegated in a lab with the same five people who, you know, they're great people, but they're not the most socially adept creatures that have ever walked the planet. So I found out that I didn't like doing science during my PhD. But fortunately, when you're doing that program, you have a lot of time to find areas that do that you do gravitate to, that you do have a strong passion for. And so during that PhD, I found the things that I love. And one of them happened to be scientific communication. I think that's why I sort of went into it thinking that I wanted to be a professor because that seemed like the most clear-cut conventional forum where you get to teach and communicate and spread knowledge and spread ideas. So once I figured out that that's the thing, that is the gold mine that I need to harvest and I need to try to find and leverage in a career or in a profession, that's how serendipitously I found the MSL role. That's interesting. Yeah, so... And you mentioned scientific communications, and that is, of course, the key topic here. So what about scientific communications attracts you so much? I mean, to be honest with you, my brain kind of thinks it, it when I'm reading something and I'm digesting something, it goes into my brain and somewhere in the hippocampus or in the cortex, somewhere in that nebulous mix, I am thinking in terms of how could I explain this to somebody who doesn't, who's not a biochemist? who's not a neuroscientist, who's not a, you know, a cancer biology researcher, whatever it is, I always am thinking in that way. And so when I'm learning science, it goes into my brain and how I'm processing it and internalizing it and trying to really, you know, keep it up there in that, in that brain, I am processing it by imagining how do I explain this? How can I, how do I understand this abstract concept? And so then once I, because that happens naturally in me, whenever I'm out communicating with people, I would always get excellent feedback and I would always see, I would see that light bulb moment whenever I was either tutoring, TAing classes, or actually lecturing for one of my boss's classes. I just, that made me feel just so fulfilled seeing that light bulb moment when a student or someone got a concept that they never understood before. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Now, of course, you know, teaching this to students or talking to key opinion leaders is quite a different thing. How would you say that um, now being in the MSL role and talking with key opinion leaders, how is it different for you? Well, it's different because, you know, as a PhD biochemist, that a lot of that stuff ends up being kind of pie in the sky, mechanistic. Uh, we have evidence to suggest that it's implicated in a disease, but it is very far removed from a translational clinical. This information could actually have an impact on somebody's life that's coming into a hospital, coming into a clinic. So what I found was, is that when you're talking with KOLs, a lot of communication, I think good communicators are empathetic people. They are constantly in their own mind thinking, Am I making sense to this person? Are they missing certain context because they're not a biochemist? Maybe I need to walk it back a little bit and check in with them to see if they understand this very broad concept before we drill down a mile deep. So I think empathy is a big part of um, communication. And I think also with KOLs, they're clinicians. They are busy. 
they are getting paid to see patients, whether that's in the hospital or in the outpatient clinic or in their private practice. That's where their bread and butter is. So you coming in there to communicate with them, you have to be empathetic thinking about from their shoes, they're a clinician, they're not a scientist, and they have patients and waiting rooms backed up. So you have to find ways to make it creative, make it captivating, but also make it concise. You do not want to be wasting these people's time. I like that. Creative, captivating, and concise. The three C's. Um, we're, yeah, we're, we're going to dive deeper into that. But before we do, um, can you maybe help me understand, like, how does a day in the life of an MSL look like? Like, how many how many physicians do you visit on an average day? How long are your visits? Like, trying to, um, for the people that maybe have not been in, a, in, in an MSL role, um, to explain how this would be. Trying to explain this answer is one of the hardest challenges, and I haven't gotten better at it over six years explaining this to people. There really is no sort of set structure to your workday as a medical science liaison. It is not a nine to five. I'm not clocking in at nine in the morning and then saying, well, it's five o'clock. Yes, I'm out of the office. It's, it ebbs and flows. And so I think a big reason for why that is, is because your schedule is predicated on scheduling with a KOL who their schedule is busy and up in the air. So you're, it, some weeks you're getting hit with a lot of, I'm doing a lot of HCP meetings, you know, and then other weeks you're kind of catching up. You're doing a lot of admin. Uh, maybe you're prepping for the next big business trip that you're going to be planning for maybe three weeks out. Maybe you're balancing an internal uh, work stream. So maybe you're uh, the MSL lead for clinical trials. So there's internal projects maybe the next week because you were in the field the previous week. Next week, I need to stay home and I need to catch up on some of those internal work streams that I'm a part of where I'm working with clinical development. Or if I'm part of Speakers Bureau, maybe I'm working with uh, sales and commercial and marketing. Who knows? But because you're doing so much, there is no nine to five. It's impossible to say what you're going to be doing one day versus the next. And so that's also something that really... When I read about it, and then I did the informational interviews to talk to active MSLs who are in the position, they had explained that. And that made me really excited that it wasn't a nine to five. It wasn't a monotonous, same thing every day. I'm going to come in, I'm going to sterilize these reagents, I'm going to make these cells, I'm going to you know, sacrifice these lab mice so that I can dissect their brains. Whatever it is, it's... it's it ends up being the same thing. It feels like in this job, you're constantly being challenged uh, and you have to be agile and dynamic enough to adapt to it. Yeah. I, I'm also someone who likes variation. So I, I kind of get it now a few years ago or well, quite a few years ago by now I did research among healthcare professionals and I, because I really wanted to understand how do they consume information? What different channels and sources do they use to stay up to date and of course you know msls are a very big and important part of that so we did this research and we had them rank those different channels so think about publications conferences msls there were like 20 different channels and we asked them to rank them by how valuable they were to them and somehow um msls landed really low on that on that scale like 17 out of 20 to be exact then um, I thought, like, okay, maybe this was just like a research flow. Let's let's monitor this, and then more and more research came out, which is basically supporting that the same um, the same outcome over time. So this seems to be like a more consistent situation. And I'm wondering, as an MSL, why do you think this is the case? Why do you think somehow that this perception might exist among certain ATPs? It's a, it's a great question. And I think when you, when you quoted your study, you said that was done in, uh, I think, 2018. Yeah. So um, I uh, presented this at the DIA, the Drug Information Association Conference, in 2018. But then more recently, uh, I think it was 2022, there was also data on this. And it's basically, I've seen probably four or five different sources that support this same finding. So I'm pretty sure that something is going on here. And I'm not saying that MSLs are not doing a great job, but I'm just... <laughs> It puzzles me, and I'm trying to understand why. And I, I do have some ideas, but like, I'm wondering on your perspective as an MSL. 
Yeah. I mean, so thought provoking question. I think a few things. Number one, I'd be curious about in that survey or the questionnaire that was sent out to these physicians who did answer and rank sort of the priority of what sort of weight they put on uh, in terms of where they get sources of information. I'd be curious if the folks who ranked MSLs down there, like you said, like around 17th out of 20, I'd be curious if they have actually interacted with an MSL because theoretically they could be ranking it low because they've never have interacted with an MSL and you don't know what you don't know and you don't know how valuable something is until you find out how some, until you start working with them. I had no idea how valuable a CPA is. I know this isn't related to medical affairs, but I didn't know that until I actually met with a CPA and I started giving them all this information and I started seeing how their brain worked of, oh, Mike, you don't need to pay $4,500 to the IRS. You only need to pay 70. Let me do the documentation for you. So I didn't know that. So I'd be curious if those HCPs who ranked that, did they ever interact with an MSL? But aside from that, I think it, it comes down, I think that is one bucket of clinicians that are out there who don't understand what the medical science liaison role is. So even if, say, say um, there's Dr. Smith out there, I'm trying to reach out to Dr. Smith as the MSL, I send him an email or I send her an email and I say, my name is Dr. Michael Moore. I'm a medical science liaison with Insert My Company. That doctor may not understand, they, they may not know what a medical science liaison is. All they see is that you work and you're employed by a pharmaceutical or a biotech company. And in their eyes, that automatically means that you're a sales rep. So it could be that they're ranking it low because they've never interacted firsthand with an MSL. And any, it's something that when you're building the relationships with these people, I do constantly check in with them. And I do say, hey, just out of curiosity, you know, like whenever I first started like interacting with you, what prompted you to want to like actually spend time with me and I'll get feedback from KOLs. And it's just like, well, number one, you didn't waste my time. And I trusted you. Like, I, I really tr believe that you are a scientific, um, you have a scientific mind. And then, you, and I loved how you explain things. You saved me time because of how you explain things. You made it interesting and you made it relatable. So I would get feedback from KOLs and that's the ones who were willing to give me some of their time. What if you're somebody out there as a clinician, you just don't know what you don't know. You don't understand that an MSL isn't sales motivated. I have a base salary. I don't make any more money if you write the script or not. Month to month, I'm getting the same amount. So this is why when, in my job, whenever I'm at medical conferences and I just bump into somebody in the elevator and I introduce myself, I typically screen strangers in this context where I say, just out of curiosity, Jane, have you ever heard of uh, the profession medical science liaison before? Have you ever interacted with one from industry in the past? And then I screen them. It, then you'll, they'll say, no, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Then I explain it. And if they have, then it saves me time because I don't have to explain. I go, oh, great, Jane. Then you've worked with a medical science liaison in the past. You don't need, to under, you don't need me to explain that I'm your medical pulse the company. If you want any type of insight, all you got to do is ask me and then we make it work. I get you the information. This is um, this is really like a pearl of wisdom, I think. And I'm not sure if you ever heard about this concept. It's called the curse of knowledge, right? And uh, what it basically means is that, you know, like the, uh, the image you have of the, you know, you can see like the old woman or like a very young woman. And it's the same picture, right? It's like a mind trick. And once you see one you cannot unsee it, right? And that is basically what the curse of knowledge is too. Sometimes we know things and we don't realize that the other person might not see the same as us. So we work in the industry, we all talk about our products or the science around our products, right? And we are MSLs, so we know what an MSL is, obviously. And now we assume and project it on our audience a little bit they, and just fully assume they know exactly who we are, what we're for, what we're talking about, um, which is often not true, right? So I think what you just said is very valuable for anyone in this field to never make that assumption and always do like a step back and just quickly check in, just like you said it, like let, let's just check if the person actually knows what an MSL is, because if not, you can set the scene and um, 
make sure they understand the kind of value that you're supposed to bring to the table there. So I, I really like that. Um, you mentioned also, um, you know, previously, like the, the three C's and uh, and I think that's also related to this. Um, I am curious, like you are, and anytime I speak with any healthcare professional, I ask like a bunch of questions that I'm wondering about. So I've been asking the same question. Um, I did notice that indeed, like there, there are many HPs out there that don't know what an MSL is or what they're for. Um, like one person responded like, oh, Wesley, do you mean these people that always comment on my deck for the satellite symposia? Or, you know, like there were like, there were like a lot of different responses to it. And some said, oh, you mean the sales rep? So yeah, you're right. Like that is often, that confusion is often made. Um, but what I also heard is that, you know, one in particular said like, well, sometimes the MSL comes in and starts talking about all this data, but they don't really tell me why it's important. Like, yeah, great. This is the data. Um, but I kind of need to understand what this means to me. Like, what does it mean to me? Should I change something? What kind of patients is this applicable to? And what does it mean to them? Um, and um, and that makes me think about storytelling, which is like a thing I, I'm, I'm really into. And I'm wondering um, about, um, you know, since you have a lot of storytelling experience here in driving these scientific narratives, can you tell a little bit more about how you suggest MSLs can create more context around presenting their data? It all stems back to the empathy. Put yourself in a clinician's shoes, which I had to learn how to do that. As a scientist, I don't have any frame of reference. So I had to learn what does a clinician think and what are their priorities? And they're, sometimes you find a clinician who is a big science nerd. And so you do have that Venn diagram that overlaps more between you and that individual person. Some clinicians are more clinical and the science is all great and all that stuff, but they are in the throws or they're in the front lines and they're just not as interested in that. They're more interested in skip out on the nerdy science. You don't need to talk to me about this descending inhibitory pain pathway. Instead, just tell me like how to use the product and what are the considerations around it? Um, who are the right patients for it? So empathy, think about from the clinician's shoes, what they're dealing, what their world is like before you even step in to their office or before you even hop on the Zoom call where they're going to be on it with you. Just think, what are they going through? They have a lot probably going on. I need to make this clear, captivating, and concise. And so then it's about, this is why this job is an art and there's a craft to it. There's a white belt level, beginner level, medical science liaisoning, liaising, and there is black belt level. And then there's the whole continuum between there in terms of how, what level you're at in terms of your performance and what you're able to accomplish. So for, so for explaining something to somebody, walking into a doctor's office and just going, hey, Dr. Smith, oh my goodness. So I have a lot to talk to you about. We just got this study that was published at this medical conference. Uh, we looked at blah, blah, blah. That's, yeah, that's, that's white belt. That's white belt. Anybody can do that. Anybody can just walk in and just talk about a bunch of data. Basic, very basic. Now, what happens when you start leveling up and you hopefully have good mentors that help cultivate and develop your talent and your skill? You'll then say, okay, phrase it, let's frame it differently. Instead of going in there, if you were that doctor and you've just seen multiple patients, you've been up since 7.30 in the morning, uh, and now you're, beh you're also behind on schedule and you're honoring this meeting, would you want to just get inundated and just hit with a tsunami of clinical data? Are you, and then not even that, not even do you want to, even if you did, would your brain even be in a, in a, in a situation where it could absorb that information? Is it, is the groundwork or the environment fertile for learning? And in that case, it's not, even if you do data dump, do you really think they're going to retain 100% of that information? They may retain, depending on their focus and attention, they may retain like 5%, you know, of what you say. And they may, they may remember only one word you said out of that whole interaction, because you know why? If you have empathy, you understand that that clinician ha is running late and they have to get back. They have to get back to the patients or they have to get back on the phone 
to argue with some insurance about some uh, prescription that they made that they thought was the best judgment and some insurance you know company is like nope we don't think so dr smith you shouldn't write that so yeah that's a long answer but basically empathy and trying to make it come to life trying to think what is it that they want to know what motivates them so can we delve deeper into that second part like the empathy yes that's clear and i think it's super important now is more contextual conversation how can you maybe give an example or um, or can you give some tips on how MSLs could actually do that? So how do you make it more relatable? A few things. Number one is preparation. Uh, if you're a good MSL, I'm not even saying stellar, good average standard, you should be doing a lot of preparation before you hop on a Zoom call or before you do any meeting with an external stakeholder, there should be an iceberg uh, magnitude of preparation and diligence that you've done on your end before you even hop on that call or before you even get on that meeting. So from your preliminary research that you're doing into these KOLs, I'm watching their YouTube lectures. I'm hopping on clinicaltrials.gov to see if, they've, if they're part of any current or ongoing trials. I'm obviously scouring the medical literature to see if they publish anything. And I'm also hopping on their personal websites or maybe hopping on LinkedIn if they're active on LinkedIn. And I am looking at all of these available resources to get a picture of what motivates this clinician. What are they interested in? What topics are they fascinated in? You know, a therapeutic area is a big umbrella. So what areas underneath that umbrella does this clinician specifically interested in? Maybe if I maybe I do a res I do research on somebody I'm about to meet, and this is a big KOL, and I watch a YouTube lecture where they talk about health disparities in neurology. I'm going to go in there, and and then I'm going to process that and think: Is there an opportunity where this is something that that clinician or that KOL is interested in, and is there a way to bridge this gap between their clinical interest and the interest of the company? And is there a way we could? Again, Venn diagram, overlap those things and have it be a win-win to build the relationship with that person. So preparation is number one on trying to make something come to life and really make sure that the message that you're communicating is landing and landing on receptive ears and a receptive brain. The other thing is asking questions. I, I kind of intimated this earlier about, you know, if I'm at a medical conference and I'm just randomly engaging with people which I do at conferences. I really let my extroversion fly and I just meet with people and then I get their contact information. And I connect them with wh whomever their MSL is, but I'll ask them questions. I ask a lot of questions to probe and to sort of see. I'm kind of like when I'm with questions and when I'm asking questions to a KOL, it's kind of like I'm knocking on doors in their mind. And sometimes based on me interpreting their body language or how they respond to a question, I realize that that's a door that's shut. Okay, let's not go in that door because it's shut. They're not really interested in that. They didn't really elaborate much on that answer. Now, if I ask them another question and now they're, oh, now they're like off to the races, you know, talking to me about all of this and they can't stop talking, that's a door that just opened up. That's something that they're interested in. So I make a little mental note of that. And then I also, and then part of your job is, again, trying to connect the dots, finding out what they're interested in, connecting the dots with what the company and what the disease state needs to advance the medicine. Yeah, I really like this, Michael. And um, it really resonates with me. Uh, we are working a lot with, you know, many pharmaceutical companies to help them basically help field medical leadership, help their MSLs to do the best job ever, right? And provide the tools and resources to do so. And um, we're talking a lot about two different things. One is like the storytelling, which has a lot to do with with what you were talking about in your preparations, right? Because how could you personalize a message if you don't know really who you're talking to, right? There, there is no off the shelf message that works for everyone, like a one size fits all, right? It, it's always like a, a one size fits uh, everyone like a little bit. So I really like your point about doing that research and then not just doing the research and absorbing the information you get from it, but actually really doing an effort to understand like how it impacts the narrative you're going to discuss. 
I just wanted to hop in there because you're bringing up a good point. The storytelling and doing all this. One example that I can give you a crystal clear example is there was a KOL that I hadn't met with, and this was a big, big KOL, uh, academic KOL, and I knew not, I did my research on them. But the game changer that got me sort of when I did get a chance to meet with them and I could use a storytelling tactic with them, it landed because what I did was I did all the preliminary research, and then I. Um, the last thing I typically do after I do all of that research is I talk to my internal stakeholders at the company. I say, hey, sales rep, hey, market access, hey, uh, patient support. All these people who are out there meeting with people who are external stakeholders, has anybody interacted with Dr. So-and-so at University of So-and-so? And the sales rep said, oh, yeah, I haven't had a lot of time with them, but um, they did bring me in their office one time. And I'm like, okay, well, what did you see? And they were like, oh, like they had a lot. Uh, Doctor So and So had a lot of um, uh, Lakers stuff, basketball. I love basketball, Wesley. Um, so whenever I met with them, I use the basketball analogy when I'm explaining the data. So I was explaining the data. There was a, and I'm not giving anything away. I'll just speak very generally here. the The example was there was uh, an intervention or a treatment that led to around a 66% response. So two thirds of patients who received that intervention, that active treatment got a response. The placebo got maybe two out of five. So that's 40%. So you're looking at active treatment, two out of every three, 66% response, placebo, two out of every five, 40% response. So when I was explaining that data endpoint to this doctor, whom I'd done the research on prior to this and talked with the sales rep who said, yeah, they, I think they're a basketball fan. They have a bunch of Lakers you know, memorabilia in there. So when I explained that, I said, like, Dr. Smith, are you a basketball fan? Because I didn't want to tell them I did all this you know, research in the back. I just said, are you a basketball fan? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the Lakers. Da, 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 da. I'm like, okay, well, like, you're, you obviously know who Steph Curry is. Steph Curry is one of the, he is the greatest perimeter shooter ever in the history of the NBA. I will debate that till the day I die. And he shoots a career average of 42%. So let's just say that's 40%. So Dr. Smith, Steph Curry, who's the greatest shooter in the NBA ever, is making around two out of every five of his shots. Now, what if there's a new prospect out there who NBA scouts have discovered who can make two out of every three shots? Do you think that that's a significant difference? Now, what if the outcome isn't making a three? What if the outcome is getting patients to pain relief? So you see, I took the information that I had gathered, which was all the upfront legwork that nobody sees. Nobody sees this, all the stuff that goes into prepping for it. Then how do you take that key piece of information and use that to your advantage to leverage it in a storytelling fashion, using that data to tell a story to make a data point resonate with an individual KOL. That's just beginning to end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for outlining this. This is very helpful and provides a lot of context. Um, the second part that you were talking about was about asking questions. And that's another big thing. We've been working on some kind of framework um, where we define uh, a range of questions that are actually not supposed Post necessarily to collect information but you know questions are also very useful to kind of create a prompt and make people think right i've given a lot of public speaking training and one of the things i always say is like integrate rhetorical questions in your presentations and even when someone says like uh, makes sense right like you don't really expect anyone to answer but like it's just this natural tendency of people when you ask a question to kind of perk up and pay attention so we thought we can leverage this, this kind of psychological phenomenon by creating questions that help people maybe understand their own situation. Like you could ask something about like, well, um, doctor, do you ever uh, have to deal with patients that respond to this therapy in that or that way? Right. And it, it just makes people pause a little bit more and think like, yeah, actually I do. And it's a problem. And then you, and it opens the door to have additional conversation and, there's, um, you know, not every MSL might be as um, as able 
to come up with all of these questions. So we thought, you know, this is maybe a cool tool to develop, like a kind of preparation tool that you use before you actually do the visit and look at different questions you could ask for that particular situation, therapy, or, you know, whichever topic you're, you're discussing. So now my question is like, we, so we spoke about two things here, like, you know, personalize your message by researching your audience really well in advance, um, using questions to prompt conversation. What other things could be done? And I'm specifically maybe looking for how you think that field medical leadership can help their MSLs to have better conversations and better scientific dialogue. Is there anything that comes to mind that they can do to help their teams? So with field medical training or field medical leadership, it's a really arduous, challenging task. But if they could find a way to do a training with the MSL team and say, hey, number one, do we all buy in that questions are important? And number two, do we all buy into the fact that there, there's ways that you could possibly be leveling up your questions? asking more incisive questions, or maybe asking more strategic based questions that if whatever information that they would give you, that directly leads to a medical insight, something that MSLs are constantly uh, being assessed on, you know, and something that is the value that we bring to the company are our medical insights. So, if there's a way to design, I haven't seen a way to design that training, but that would be the goal of it would be to train the MSL team on the power of questions. And let's go through maybe a workshop or something about how, what tactics we could implement to level up your questions so that you're asking questions that give you something rather than just asking, have you ever seen the movie um, Finding Forrester? No. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. It's a movie that was kind of a follow up to Goodwill Hunting, and it has Sean Connery, but it's a, instead of a math prodigy, it's about a linguistics verbally gifted um, uh, student. And so, one of the, the concepts in that movie is Sean Connery delineates the type of question that the student's asking, and he delineates them by a, what's called a soup question. That is, the question that you're asking gives you some direct benefit. But when you're not asking a soup question, that category would be asking you like, oh, you know, how's your day going, Wesley? He makes the argument that that doesn't really benefit you in any way. It doesn't give you practical sort of helpful information. So that's not a soup question. So that's what the whole field medical training would be. The field medical training would be getting you to ask more incisive strategic questions that give us as a field medical organization more to work on and more weight that we can kind of drive decisions within the company. Yeah, I love it. And, th and that is exactly what I was referring to before. Uh, so we, we help a little bit with that. And also the questions should be based on insights. They shouldn't be just questions, right? Like you can actually tap into uh, even like your, your uh, med info colleagues that have a database with questions that are asked mostly. You can look at like recent advisory board reports um, you can look at your, even at your SAP, your scientific communications platform, what are your key messages? All of that should go into how you develop those questions and create really, really strong ones. So I like the idea of training on the skill of asking questions, but I also think there's some work to be done from field medical leadership to help their teams um, come up with some ideas around those questions or maybe some question options that you can tap into. And, but I also like how you tie this into, into key insights. Um, and it made me think about, like, you use the word assessed, you know, how MSLs are being assessed. Um, and that kind of um, made me think about um, how could we get better at understanding whether the MSLs are doing a good job. And I don't mean this as performance assessment necessarily, but if you, again, when you look at field medical leadership, you give some kind of training. So let's go, let's say we do a storytelling training and we give them some of these questions. How can we actually confirm that it works? What is a good way to understand from directly from the HCPs that it actually works? I'm going to tell you something right here. And I don't, I don't, I'm going to guess that I'm not saying anything groundbreaking here, but what I'll say is one strategy that doesn't work is by directly reaching out to the HCP. And asking them, hey, Dr. Smith, did you find that valuable? 
it's it it it's the intuitive solution but i forget what the vocab word is for uh something that like seems like it makes sense but when you look deeper it it just falls apart it how do you assess the impact it's a good question i think there's a fundamental gap and i don't mean to say this everywhere because i haven't worked everywhere there's there in certain places that i've worked i have seen that there's a fundamental gap sometimes between leadership and i'm talking executive leadership c suite and the executive leadership who's making a decision that un, unequivocally was going to impact somebody like an msl who's in a field based role so the c suite's making the decision the msls then the decision rolls down to the MSLs. Now they have to pull it through and they have to execute on it. There's sometimes a gap when you're looking at what is the goal? What is the carrot that is, that is being dangled in front of you that you're supposed to be shooting for or aiming for? You can tell a lot about whether leadership understands the medical science liaison role and understands not only the ins and outs and nuances of it, but also understands impact. And the the potential for what could come about from an MSL dropped into a territory. I think that is sometimes nebulous to field medical or not to field medical leadership. This is goes beyond field medical leadership. This is going way up into the company. I think sometimes there's a gap or a dissonance in that understanding. And so when you're talking about how MSLs are assessed, yeah, it's the conventional industry standard stuff. How many meetings are you having a month? a semester, a quarter. How many insights are you submitting? A month, a semester, whatever. Yeah, so quantitative mainly, not so much qualitative, right? Which is the hard part. Like, and, and let's be honest, I mean, I quoted this, this research that I did and, and there was a lot of follow-up research on that and it doesn't look that good, right? And so we can't blame them either. <laughs> um, but I think everyone is looking for this solution and how, how do you actually really assess that? And I agree with you too, like just directly going like to them as kind of a review system it's like well how was your interaction you know i don't think that works either but there must be a way to measure this better and understand how you drive impact because otherwise it's going to be very hard to optimize what you're doing and to understand how we can collectively get better at it i think for me when i look at like nebulous abstract problems like this how do you assess the performance or the or just the uh, the level of impact of an individual MSL. If you're somebody who has to, you're somebody who's C-suite. So you are in a very important position uh, to look and assess. Well, as C-suite, I have a bigger perspective that I have to focus on. I have to look at: Is this person driving enough value to warrant what we are paying them? And so. Whenever I look at those types of problems, I tend in my simpleton brain to kind of look at a simple solution. Like, what is the simplest core thing that an MSL does that I think both parties would agree upon? That is, the MSL would agree upon that this is a core, fundamental, cardinal responsibility and a cardinal goal. And then also, does the leadership, would the leadership also agree to that? I think one thing that's very simple that unites both of those parties that could help bridge that gap is if companies started, instead of relying so heavily on industry standard convention of looking at how many interactions, how many HCP meetings or KOL interactions have you had? How many insights have you submitted? How many clinical presentations have you done? Those are all fine and well, but if you, you could, I think you could take away some of those if you just focused on something as simple as impacts. And that's a general term, but I think both parties, the MSL, if you're an MSL, you want to have an impact on your KOLs and you want to have an impact in the territory that you cover. And I think the company, if I'm the C-suite and you ask me, hey, do you think that MSLs, like, do you think that they should be focused on trying to make an impact with the KOLs that they're interacting with? Do you think that they should be motivated to have an impact in their territory? I don't know of any executive leader who would say, that's ridiculous. I don't want them having an impact. Okay, so 
if both parties agree to that, that MSLs, we want to have an impact in the field and with our KOLs and the leadership, you agree that MSL should have an impact with their KOLs and in their territory. Why don't we assess MSLs on their impact with KOLs and in the territory? Now, the problem is, is that that's not industry standard. So there's going to be a lot of upfront legwork that has to be done on developing a system and an infrastructure to adopt this new kind of, you know, unique non-traditional sort of way of assessing performance. But like I said, my argument is that both parties would agree to that. And so then it comes about, how do you develop the system? If we're assessing MSLs based on their impact with KOLs or in the territory, then it becomes, okay, well, let's start developing and building a new system. Yeah, I really like that. And and this has happened in several other areas, right? If, if you look at medical education, for instance, there have been new models to measure impact. But for this particular area, it's really hard because it's very subjective too, right? And I think that's kind of the point of the research I mentioned as well. It's like, it's subjective, like you said. Maybe these are doctors that never saw an MSL or they don't even know what it means, right? And so, yeah, I think the the industry is really eager to have a model to measure impact, but it's really hard to do. But, uh, you know, whenever you, you get there, <laughs> let well, me know. I mean... <laughs> And I thought about this. I mean, impacts, right? Impacts, just like how I explained with the white belt to black belt, there's, I think, degrees and a continuum of the magnitude of the impact that an MSL could have. There's white belt level impact. Now, is that to say that that's not impact? There's no impact there whatsoever? Absolutely not. If there's a, if, if you're a KOL and I meet with you and you tell me that you, you despise my company's class of medications, or this pharmacologic, this pharmacologic class of agents, it's like, oh, I hate those. I hate those meds. Okay. Well, what if I have an impact on you that over time, building the relationship, getting to know you, finding out about you, adapting storytelling so that the message resonates with you over time, what if that needle moves with you? Where when we first met, you said, I hate, I hate this class of medications. I think that just, it's been the worst thing to the therapeutic area since blah, blah, blah. If I can take that KOL and I can move the needle with them where now they can see the value of this pharmacologic class. Yeah, that is, that's a subjective thing. But is that an impact? I think that's an impact. I had a positive change with this person and yeah, I guess, you know, it falls back on the honor system. I have, you have to trust that the KOL is telling you the truth in order for it to count that as an impact. What if they're just whistling Dixie and just telling you what you want to hear? But okay, so then that means like everything fundamentally in our job is, you know, you can't prove or you can't discern. A lot of this stuff is subjective. This is an inherently or an intrinsically abstract job. It is an art. There's a craft to it. And so if you're... I think that's why the industry standard approach, it's my theory as to why the industry went towards these very basic sort of metrics, because they're easy. They're easy. If you have a CRM, it's easy for me as your manager to know how many people you met with in a month or in a quarter. I can run that filter in that CRM software. So it was the easy choice. My argument is it's not the best choice. So... That's where this impacts discussion comes up. I like that. It makes me think about uh, metrics versus uh, OKRs or KPIs versus OKRs. Not sure if you ever heard about that, but like we have like KPIs or key performance indicators. That's more like numerical, quantitative, like it kind of measures where you are. While OKRs, uh, objectives and key results is more like monitoring progress towards a vision, right? So um, yeah, there's definitely some work to do there. Hey, Michael, um, this is fun. But time is flying, so I'm going to ask you a last question here. Where do you see field medical going in the next five years? So what do you think is on the horizon for us? How do you imagine we're going to evolve? I love this question because I, I do love... I'm a big sci-fi genre fan, so I'm always, I'm always extrapolating and thinking about the future and what, what it's going to hold. So with medical affairs... I don't think it's going anywhere. The, I mean, it's a critical function within the industry, and I think it does serve 
just an invaluable purpose of educating and spreading awareness of disease state, but also spreading accurate, timely information to the folks who are out there on the front lines trying to treat these people. And they have to use they have to use what the companies are developing, these pharmaceutical companies and these uh, biotech companies. They need to use that cutting edge scientific sort of advances in the technology. So where does the where does the future hold? I think it's going to be interesting, Wesley, what comes about with this artificial intelligence stuff. Those are two words that you just drop into your presentation title. And right there, right there is your like, you're going to get a crowd probably. It could be artificial intelligence in the relationship to choosing what type of tea you like. You know, it could be something completely mundane, but I think if you drop artificial intelligence in there, it just adds cachet and pizzazz to it. So where is artificial intelligence going to have a bigger role in healthcare? And if so, um, how are medical science liaisons 20 years from now in Blade Runner 2049 when they have artificial intelligence, maybe at that point has really, you know, caught its stride and now it's everywhere in healthcare and in clinical trials as well. And now MSLs, maybe at that time point, maybe they're going to have to start explaining artificial intelligence and how these machine learning programs have identified certain trends that could help their patient population in their clinics. Who knows? Artificial intelligence is something that as a dilettante, I have no understanding of, but it does, it does fascinate me. Um, I think, where else could it be going? I think also how MS, what sort of tech MSLs actually have at their disposal when they're educating people. One thing that's very evident after six years of doing this job is that people learn differently. Some people need to see the chart that has that 66% versus 40%. And the message just doesn't fully resonate with them until they visually see, oh my gosh, two thirds versus two fifths. That's a very big difference. Other people that I meet with, they don't care about seeing anything. They just say, give me the cliff notes. Give me, just boil it down. Speak in bullet points. So I think if in the future, MSLs have different type of technology that could actually really bridge the gap with certain providers that may, that may want something a little bit more engaging. You know, this is great talking to you, but what if instead of explaining how a partial agonist antipsychotic works and what are some of the clinical benefits that may be conferred from having a partial agonist, you know, antipsychotic. What if instead of explaining this to you verbally, or what if instead of showing you a typical PowerPoint slide, Wesley, of, you know, partial agonism and showing it and showing pharmacologically what that concept is. What if I had (laughs) augmented reality? (laughs) What if I had an iPad with me as an MSL. And I could actually, with you, imagining that you're here in my office with me, I could take the iPad and I could show an image of a dopamine receptor that is being, it's augmented reality. So through my iPad, it's going to look like it's sitting on my desk right now. And that, that, that dopamine receptor is floating in three-dimensional space. And what if there was some module that I could go through with you that we would be looking at this augmented visual, this augmented graphic, as I'm explaining these concepts of, so when this drug binds to it, it is not inhibiting the activity like you'd expect with a lot of the other conventional antipsychotics, the first generations. This is different. So, And then you would actually be watching it together. That could be somewhere where the future goes in terms of leveraging technology to get these messages across more effectively. Oh, I like that. I really like that. Well, thank you, Michael. It was really a pleasure to talk with you today. I think it was very insightful. Thanks so much for sharing all your thoughts and insights here uh, with all of our medical affairs colleagues. Thanks so much for having me, Wesley. This is a blast. 
Transforming Medical Communications is brought to you by MedComs Experts. To find out more about MedComs Experts and how we create some of the most cutting edge medical communications programs anywhere in the world, visit www.medcoms-experts.com. And then make sure to search for Transforming Medical Communications in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at MedComs Experts, thanks for listening.